Thanks. All right, well, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Scott Cheney Peters. I'm the uh, president of SimSec. Um, I just wanted to start tonight with uh, several thank yous. Uh, the first one goes out to uh, Steptoe and Johnson, uh, who have who are hosting us here, and they've been very gracious with letting us not only use their facilities, but also help us to set everything up, help us to arrange the uh, uh, drinks and uh, beverages for you. And particularly, uh, John O'Connor is, is he here? Yes, is right here. Is a yes, but he is a partner here, so he's their representative, and he's a Marine, um, once and always a Marine. Uh, so. Uh, and he's also published in proceedings previously. So. So thank you for, uh, for helping us with this. Uh, Velma Powell, who is their coordinator, uh, was also very instrumental in helping us get this set up. So thanks to her. Uh, she's not here tonight, however. Uh, the Naval Institute, the uh, U.S. Naval Institute, was also very gracious in helping to uh, support the funding uh, that went into helping us provide these drinks and refreshments. And then also our members uh, and readers for SimSec. Uh, we had a Kickstarter campaign this fall that helped us become a 501c3 organization as a, a nonprofit. And a lot of the uh, money that was uh, raised as part of that Kickstarter campaign also helped to go fund things such as this event, cover the, the remaining uh, fees for the, the food and drinks, as well as an essay contest that we had uh, just finished wrapping up. Uh, so thank you for all of you for being here, um, readers and members. Uh, we've had some people that are very instrumental in helping us accomplish this event tonight. Uh, Dimitri and uh, Ty, uh, two volunteers with SimSec, as well as Brett, our treasurer, up front here. Um, they all helped this event come together, so thanks to you. Uh, and then you again in the audience uh, for being here. I know there was some inclement weather uh, today, and we were hoping that we wouldn't have to cancel the event, and we did not, and you're here, so we appreciate that. Uh, We, we hope you enjoy the event tonight, and, and we hope you and thank you for sharing this evening with us. For This is our first annual forum for authors and readers, and that's where the name CIFAR comes from. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, the presentations after BJ goes, uh, all of the presenters were selected um, by our readers over the preceding weeks. Uh, each of them published on our website sometime during the past year, and then our readers voted on what their favorite pieces or just people that they wanted to come and they could heckle. I think it was one or the other. Uh, and so you're in for a treat with them. Uh, a main component of our mission at SimSec is bringing in new perspectives and voices uh, into discussions about maritime security. And tonight's lineup reflects that. We have everybody from young professionals who see a pair of lieutenants down at the end uh, to those in their second or third uh, security and maritime security careers. Uh, tonight's presentations will be recorded and later uploaded to YouTube. So if you really like something, you're going to watch it again, or if you thought something was particularly interesting, you can share it with friends. Uh, but for those of you, you who would like to make your friends jealous that are not currently here, you can also live tweet the event. Uh, our hashtag is CFAR15. Uh, I know some of you have already said you're, you've started the, the live tweeting, so I appreciate that as well. Uh, and we're trying to make this an, an informal event. So you know, feel free to get up. You know, if you need to use the restrooms, they're right outside. If you'd like to grab another drink or another slice of pizza, it's in the back. Uh, we just want to make this a conversation, so don't feel that this is a very formal setting. Uh, I know most of you, a lot of you know each other, so this really shouldn't be a lot of uh, formality in tonight's event, but we do still want to um, hear some great ideas. So with that, when, you're, when you have a question, uh, we're going to have a few minutes remaining after each of the presenters uh, talks about their piece. Uh, Brett here in the front, he's going to be uh, letting you know if you're the lucky person who's raised their hand to, to get called upon to ask a question. Please try to keep it a one-part question, not the 20-part questions that can sometimes eat up a, a fair amount of time. Um, but at each of your desks or tables, you have a um, microphone. And when you press the bottom, not the actual light, the light is not the button to press. When you press the bottom, that turns it on. So wait until Brett calls on you to turn it on, and then you can ask your questions so that everybody else here in the room can hear it and engage with the uh, presenters. So to begin, I'd like to turn it over to my friend, BJ. He's a lieutenant commander in the US Navy. He's an officer on the second half staff, and he is out with his second book from the uh, Naval Institute Press. And he's, he is quite the thinker, and he is, 
here to share his thoughts about how ideas in maritime security, um, how they can be developed, what you can do with them if you want to see them make an impact and not just a quick splash, how to really bring them forward and develop them. So BJ, the floor is yours. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, as the uh, uniform of choice this evening demonstrates, uh, I'll get the disclaimer out of the way first. While I am a lieutenant commander in the Navy, my uh, talk here tonight is not representative of any formal positions and are my opinions and my opinions alone. And so tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about both of the individuals who appear in my books. Um, about William Sims and about Alfred Thayer Mahan, but we're going to focus on William Sims a little bit. Uh, Mark Twain once got frustrated with his preacher and uh, made sure he told him later that no souls are saved after the first 20 minutes. And so I'm going to try and use that as my marker tonight. So in November of 1900, Lieutenant William Sims joined the wardroom of the USS Kentucky. It was the Navy's newest battleship. And he had just come off of a tour in Paris, where as an attaché, he had been studying gunnery practices and battleship design and collecting intelligence across Europe. As Kentucky sailed for China Station, Sims got his sea legs back, and he began to check out his wardroom mates and check out the ship. And he started to compare this ship to what he had found in Europe and what he had seen. And he realized that despite new ships and a newfound place in the world based on the victory in the Spanish-American War, the U.S. Navy still had a long way to go. Many of you know the history that follows how Sims found and, quite frankly, stole the concept of continuous aim fire from a Royal Navy captain named Percy Scott. He then went on to revol revolutionize naval gunnery. And his course was treacherous and not always clear, but eventually William Sims became known throughout the fleet as the man who taught us how to shoot. The Sims continued pushing boundaries in the years following the gunnery revolution and leading up to World War I. He advocated for things like the all-big-gun battleship. He helped develop destroyer and torpedo boat tactics. And eventually, he commanded all U.S. naval forces in World War I in England. He was central to the adoption of the convoy system, which helped defeat the U-boats and win the first battle of the Atlantic. And when he returned from Europe, he assumed his second term as president of the Naval War College, where he set about setting up the system of study and war gaming that would lead to the development of naval aviation and of American submarines in the years prior to World War II. William Sims was, beyond a doubt, an innovator. Naval innovation is often seen through the prism of our technology. We talk about our game changers, or we talk about our transformations. But many of the important innovations that have come through our history are from the software, not the hardware. They're from innovations in tactics, techniques, and procedures, like the development of continuous aim fire. Ideas, it must be remembered, can be more powerful than the steel or the explosives that much of our naval heritage is, is based on. It was on the prompting of President Teddy Roosevelt that William Sims wrote his first article for publication. The success of that piece, which I'll talk a little bit about later tonight, led him to realize the power of sharing ideas through professional writing. Through the remainder of his life, he wrote about a dozen articles for the Naval Institute's journal proceedings and more for other magazines. And when he came home from World War I, he collaborated, collaborated with a civilian named Burton Hendrick, and he wrote a book. The Victory at Sea was part history and part memoir, and in 1921, it won the Pulitzer Prize. As the president of the Naval War College, at the beginning of the interwar years, Sims' thinking on naval warfare and military innovation had an impact on an entire generation of officers. These were men returning from war, trying to put their experiences in context and learn lessons for the future. They had names like Nimitz, Spruance, and Halsey. Today, the ranks of the U.S. military are again filled with a generation of men and women who are returning from war and looking to put their experiences in context and learn lessons. Many of our junior officers and enlisted had had an extreme level of responsibility during their service. 
which now causes them to bristle at the perception of micromanagement or bureaucracy. The military will likely struggle over the next couple of years as we return to more of a non-combat role. So what can we do to improve that struggle? What can we do today to ensure the lessons that we've developed are not forgotten or not ignored? Over the course of his career, Sims learned a great deal about fighting bureaucracy, about successful innovation, and about service before and after war. And he wrote about all of these subjects in articles. His knowledge and advice has sat quietly in the archives, just waiting for us to engage with them if we want to. Here with SimSex members and readers, the most relevant parts of his advice are the importance of professional writing and of personal professional learning. Sims wrote about his experience with both. They were also central to what he saw as lacking in the officer corps of the U.S. Navy. In 1906, William Sims was a lieutenant commander, and he was still the inspector of target practice. The Russo-Japanese War had just come to an end, and navalists all over the world were pouring through the reports in the press to try and determine lessons for naval warfare and where the future was taking us. They looked at the Battle of Tsushima, and they studied it, and one of these navalists was a gentleman named Alfred Thayer Mahan. Now, in his day, Mahan was the great thinker on the subject of war and peace, kind of something like a Brzezinski or Scrocroft today combined with a Stavridis or McMaster. He wrote an article for Proceedings that analyzed the Battle of Tsushima, and it drew the lesson that a properly designed fleet required battleships of only moderate size with a varied battery of all different sizes of guns. They could be built in large numbers, and they were multi mission it was a conclusion that was well in line with the thinking of most admirals, and it reflected the status quo. Now, William Sims' own experience, both gathering intelligence on battleship design and in developing continuous aim fire, suggested something entirely different. He also had a friend with a report, an after-action report, directly from the Sea of Japan. So he wrote an article that directly contradicted the great navalist. He demonstrated that the lesson of the Russo-Japanese War was that large battleships with a battery full of all big guns of only one caliber were the best way to construct a fleet, even if that meant that you could only build them in small numbers. As he wrote in the conclusion of his article, I've attempted to show that Captain Mahan's conclusions are probably in error, unquote. As the development of the British dreadnought would demonstrate, Sims was far closer to how navies were going to develop in the future than Mahan was. Sims's essay, published in Proceedings, offers readers of the in the 21st century something more than just an interesting story of two great navalists exchanging barbs. First, it demonstrates how important a healthy professional discussion can be for our national security. Without discussion generated by forward-thinking officers and junior civilian analysts, in the military and security journals, both print or today online, the military bureaucracy will stagnate and it will become reactionary. Without the engagement of innovative junior members of the team, any organization, whether military or civilian, risks becoming followers instead of leaders in their field. Sim's article also demonstrates the importance of expertise. Readers who engage with the article will understand his deep knowledge and obvious study of battleship employment and design. Today's military innovators and thinkers must learn from this example. They have to be willing to jump into the arena of ideas, but they also have to be willing to do the hard work of researching and studying their subject in order to get it right. Today, whether the debates about the future of the big deck aircraft carrier like we recently saw in Annapolis, or questions about the military effectiveness of swarming small combatants against our modern dreadnoughts. The debate and the arguments have to be logical, informed by a mastery of the facts, and they have to be well presented. Sims knew that if he was going to engage the world's great navalist in a debate in order to take on the Alfred Thayer Mahan, he had to have it right. This kind of rigorous and researched engagement in the defense questions of the day offers us all an example. 
for the 21st century. And it's something we have to aspire to no matter where we're aiming to publish, whether in a classic print journal like Proceedings or at Simsex Next War or our friends at the Strategy Bridge. But how do we get that level of expertise? Now, some of it's going to come from personal experience, right? On the deck plates, in cockpits deployed all over the world, having served in the desert, maybe working the halls of power here in Washington, D.C., on staffs or at NGOs or at think tanks. But those sources are only going to provide us with a small scale of knowledge. It's a vital foundation that we have to master, but it's something in desperate need of context and broadening. According to Sims, we have to add to that knowledge through a dedicated pursuit of personal, professional study. In 1921, Sims published his Newport lecture, The Practical Naval Officer, in Proceedings. The lecture is something like a jazz cover song, because many of the ideas in it are taken from a lecture that Mahan himself gave 30 years before. See, Sims, who had locked horns with the great navalist over Tsushima, came around to having the same thoughts as Mahan on how you develop officers to become strategic thinkers and policymakers. There's a lot to talk about in the lecture, but for tonight I'm going to focus on the third of his three pillars of strategic education. Sims lamented the fact that when he was a junior officer, he spent his time reading subjects that had no real bearing on the military profession. Now, he read some philosophy and some political economy, but he seems to have completely avoided reading military history, not engaged with international relations or current events at all. As he became more senior, he slowly realized that he was missing a lot of knowledge. And his experience at the Naval War College didn't lead him to believe he had learned the things he needed to know. Instead, the Naval War College showed him all of the things that he didn't know and needed to still go learn. He wrote, and I quote, specifically addressing the younger officers of the Navy. Let me say that you now have the opportunity you can never return. It lies with you to determine whether when you become old, you will have to regret the wasted years of your youth. Whether at that period of your life, you will find yourself simply, quote, practical men, quote, beef eaters, or really educated military naval officers. And he continued, it will depend largely on self-instruction and self-discipline. But you must, you must keep clearly in view the fact that under modern naval conditions, any officer may be highly successful and even brilliant in the, all the grades leading up to the responsible positions of high command. And then find his mind wholly unprepared to perform its vitally important functions. So where do we start? Well, Sims left us with a short reading list in his lecture, which appears in my book, 21st Century Sims. It's actually impressive how well that list of books still stands up today. But as he points out, that's just the start. Even after completing their studies at the War College, he emphasized to the graduating officers that they should consider themselves at the beginning of their education. They had to continue it on their own if they hope to achieve the level of professionalism the American people deserve from their military. There's a common bit of advice that many of us have heard from senior officers looking to mentor us. They say, take care of your job today. Do it well, and you'll be ready for the next job. Focus on today's tasks, and everything else will take care of itself. Sims comes out in direct opposition to that advice. Sure, from purely a careerist point of view, it's good advice because it's how you make sure you get the right bullets on your fit reps and the right buzzwords to ensure promotion. But from a professional point of view, the unspoken part of this advice is that you don't need to think about the questions that are, quote, above your pay grade or to think about things that come further on in your career. Instead, once you've completed your daily tasks and your administrative minutia, you can return to managing your fantasy football team or go play some more video games. It won't affect your career. Even in his day, Sims was incensed that senior officers continued to provide this advice. 
He believed that professionalism was more than the shine on your shoes or the grade on your rules of the road exam. It meant studying and reading about your profession, even in your personal time. In his recent book, Saltwater Leadership, which you're going to hear a little bit more about later on this evening, Admiral Robert Ray conducted a survey of active duty naval officers. They were asked to rank 76 different leadership traits in order of importance for junior officers to, to pay attention to or to know, to make them good officers in the Navy. And this list of traits, the final two at the list once ranked, the least important things according to the officers of the Navy for people to know or traits to have was sensitivity and scholarship. Now, a bit higher on the list, number 33, was writing ability. So this begs a question. If we haven't studied our profession or looked at it in a comprehensive and scholarly way, what exactly do we have to write about? Admiral Sims would probably take exception to this list. He'd emphasize that professional writing has to be about something. It has to demonstrate mastery not only of the technical aspects of whatever we're discussing, but also the context and the history of the issue involved. It must be the result of research, personal study, and yes, scholarship. In conclusion today, I want to leave you with the knowledge that the pursuit of professional writing, like is done at SIMSEC, and of professional study has a long history in the maritime service. It's true. There appear to be few members of the flag ranks today who published in the pages of proceedings before they had a staff that was able to help them write something. <laughs> but across time, the sailors who really made a difference, like Samuel DuPont, William Sims, Ernest King, Chester Nimitz, Bull Halsey, Bud Zumwalt, Tom Hayward, Jim Stavridis, and a few who are still serving today, studied their profession and wrote articles to forward its development. They engaged in the professional debates and discussion of the day long before they assumed the highest responsibilities of command. And our Navy and our nation are better for it. William Sims' writings offer us an opportunity to be mentored by a great leader and an accomplished man who lived a century ago. His essays and his lectures, with their examples of innovation and education and leadership, can help us look at the challenges that the militaries and organizations face today in the 21st century, ask the right questions, and find solutions. These certainly apply to those in uniform, but at their heart they apply to all leaders, whether from the military, industry, or government, everyone who's interested in the defense issues of the day. Like Alfred Thayer Mahan before him, the foundation of much of Sim's writing and thinking is the idea that asking questions and doing the hard work and study necessary to find the right questions is at the heart of being a professional. I hope that with new organizations like SIMSEC and our established predecessors like the Naval Institute, with engaged junior officers and members of the defense community, we can carry on this vital part of our Naval heritage. Thank you. And so now uh, we'll open up to questions. All right, Brett, do you want to uh, call on some folks? And uh, BJ, that was a great speech, so thank you. I don't say that lightly, but that was really, it was really a wonderful uh, talk, so. Tap your microphone there. BJ, I really appreciated your uh, talk tonight. As we were discussing, I had the privilege of reading your book. Uh, 21st Century Sims. Um, the question I have is, when I had the opportunity to attend the Naval War College about 10 plus years ago, it changed my life. I noticed, however, coming out of it, the Navy didn't fully embrace the utility of that degree, uh, kind of like how Sims wrote over 100 years ago, the role of professional education, the role of Naval War College. Uh, when it comes, push comes to shove, being on the CNO staff or uh, Navy staff trumps any type of uh, time spent at the Navy War College. Is this just part of our Navy culture? You know, Sims wrote about it. I see it still prevalent. 
Is this just going to be a fact of being in the maritime service? Uh, so I, it's a good question, right? Because the issue of, of anti-intellectualism is kind of wrapped up in this kind of question. Um, and the fact of the matter is, you're right, it, there's a long history here. When, you know, at the start of the 19th century, there was a discussion over whether or not we needed a naval academy. The answer then was, gosh, no, midshipmen learn best on ships. Right. And, and what that comes down to is something that if you look across the intellectual development of the Navy across our history is it, it comes back to that title that Sims used that he stole from Mahan, the practical naval officer. Um, our naval culture tends to value the practical. Uh, and they and it doesn't necessarily see how education can be practical and why it might be of value sometimes. Um, and it is it's a long standing cultural and historical uh, issue in in the U.S. Navy. It's something that can that can be and has been in the past overcome in the interwar years. Um, we mentioned Ernest King earlier, uh, Ernest King, Dudley Knox. And uh, and I'm forgetting his first name. The third author's last name was Pi, did a study on how to educate naval officers. And, and they actually developed a system that included multiple trips back to the classroom after the Naval Academy. It included not only a trip to the War College, but they had something else that was kind of like Naval Postgraduate School. It wasn't, which became its own entity. But they had a separate, almost graduate program that officers were sent through in the 20s and 30s. Um, you know, those kinds of things seem to have disappeared today. Now, the flip side of the coin is there's lots of important training that we still get as naval officers that has taken that time in our careers. Um, so it is an important balancing act. But I guess the fundamental question is, when is the last time we had a serious study that sat down and looked at how should you educate and train a naval officer across an entire career, regardless of community and subspecialty? And I personally, having looked around a little bit, can't find one in recent memory. I'm actually going to take the prerogative to ask a question here. Uh, BJ, you spoke a little bit about uh, folks with ideas needing to do kind of due diligence, you know, needing to put in some sweat equity if they want to really, you know, have an impact with their idea, uh, and also the importance a little bit of the presentation of their idea. And so I was wondering if there's any, you know, tips you would have or resources you think that might be underutilized that somebody who thinks that they've got something that's absolutely brilliant should maybe think about or try to take advantage of before they go forward with their idea or some of the first steps they might maybe should be taking? So I guess one of the first questions you need to ask yourself is, is this my idea? Because I have frequently thought I had great ideas and then went and realized that it came out of the book I read six months ago and forgot that I had just read that. Um, and so that's kind of where the footnotes matter, so to speak. Um, and so, you know, it, it takes a little bit of self-reflection. It's another element that Sims writes about in his, in his article on, uh, on military character. He talks about how um, the military profession, we tend not to do a lot of self-reflection. Um, and so it, it's important to think about where your ideas might come from. Uh, to be honest, find a sea daddy. Find a mentor. Find someone who's done this before. There are actually a lot of folks that have written for proceedings. They might not all make flag, but there are a lot of them who have done it. Find someone who has. Talk with them about how to go about researching and, and developing your idea further. Um, and then finally, don't be afraid to share your ideas before you try and publish them. Um, you know, we talk about risk in the Navy, and we say that we, we do risk, right? We're officers. We're in the military. Risk is part of our business. But intellectual risk is kind of a different thing than the physical risks that we all take in our jobs. Um, and intellectual risk can be really scary. Um, you need to make that leap of being willing to kind of get yourself out there and share your work with four or five trusted people who can sling arrows at you. You've got to find people who are going to sling arrows at you, right? Don't give it to people you know who are going to say, this is really great. 
No, you want someone who's going to be critical. It's not something we're always taught in the military is how to truly be critical. Um, so we need to teach ourselves. Yeah, BJ, I'm, <clears throat> my perspective is not only as a naval officer, but also as a professional engineer. So I'd say that in the engineering profession, we've got the same issue in terms of the number. I'm always appalled at the number of people who want to work in engineering organizations that seem to have no interest in our professional societies going to the meetings and things like that. And I also know from other activities, it always seems like there's only a certain percentage that really get involved. That's true as church. It's true that, you know, as a parent and organizations, I guess, any idea what, how, what percentage is and what, you know, actually are of officers are involved and, you know, and, and furthering themselves and, yeah, I actually, the, uh... I don't, I don't have a good answer of how many are involved. Although I'll tell you from from my work with the Naval Institute, I'm on the editorial board at Proceedings, um, and and from my work there and from listening to the briefs on membership, um, yeah, it's it's not good. It's not good. Um, I'll just make the pitch right here. If you're not a member of the Naval Institute. It's less than a cup of Starbucks a week to get an online membership. You get all of proceedings. They're now digitizing all of proceedings, so you get to read all of proceedings throughout history to do your research. Um, so, and if yeah, and if you write an article for proceedings, they'll give you a year membership for free. That's right. So you ought to be a member of the institute. It is the the granddaddy of the professional organizations. Um, now, that being said, we all have our, in, in, the, in the service, we all have our branch, you know, our community organizations. So jet guys who are tailhook members. Myself, I'm a Naval Helicopter Association member, right? We all, those organizations, Surface Navy Association, all have publications that we can write for also. And we ought to be. Um, and so I, I do think that membership in and engagement with professional organizations is an important part of this. And that's a really great point. I'm glad you raised it. Great. Well, I think we're going to take, a, I guess, if we get one last brief question, uh, and then we'll go for a, for a break for some uh, more food and drink. Hey. Thanks, Scott. Um, you mentioned uh, a mastery of all aspects of the issue. And something I've, uh, in my current job, I've run into a lot is the classification boundary. You always run into that with a lot of these discussions and these ideas that they float around. I don't have any comments or thoughts on that and how to get around it, how to deal with that and such. It, it is one of the, the fundamental issues with doing professional writing. You know, you're right. Classification is a huge bugaboo, right? And it's also used by those who are in uniform that don't want us writing as a tool to keep us from writing. Well, that might get close to a discussion of no, no. And so, no, we don't want you to publish that. Um, the, the, the reality is you just have to be cognizant of it. You have to work hard. You have to realize that professional writing is not just about publishing, okay? Because there are other ways that we can do professional writing and, and move discussions forward. You know, in a Navy-specific context, you know, white papers, briefs can be written and circulated on your own. You know, you're not going to get necessarily get any credit for it, right? But if you want your idea out there, you can circulate them in the Pentagon. You can find the right people to read your ideas. Um, so that might be a way to consider, you know, if you really are desperate to write about something that's classified, you know, you can find people to write, to read your ideas. You just have to realize that it's, it's classified and it's not going to get any further than that. Um, the, the, the phrase that you use, mastery of all of the aspects, it, it did kind of come out that way when I spoke, I'll admit that. I don't think any of us can reach mastery of all elements of the subjects, but it needs to be our goal. We need to be trying to do that. All right, well, thanks. Uh, I do want to just say uh, one thing that I thought was interesting was uh, when you talked about reaching out to folks, um, you know, and trying to get some you know, perspectives when you're writing your, your idea and getting some feedback. I, I think, you know, we've got a broad cross section here. It's, are from all naval officers here. We've got, I'd say maybe half people here are have some naval background, but 
you know, just looking at this audience, you know, I, one thing that I find very helpful is you know, reaching out to folks who have a completely different perspective, a completely different background, you know, providing a, a good sanity check. You know, somebody who's like, I have no idea what you're talking about in this. That's usually a good indicator that I'm not expressing myself very well. There's no uh, doubt. My wife, Charity, is my best editor hands down. Because she'll read the paragraph and say, I have no idea what the hell this means. And she's usually right. I haven't explained myself well enough. Yeah, and, and it's usually folks like that that can actually provide some, you know, some of the insights and ideas that, you know, in, a, in an insular kind of a, a way, you might otherwise not be privy to. So, so very good point. Reaching across. It's a very good point. One of William Sims's closest friends was a guy named Phil Alger who graduated with him from the Naval Academy, but then left the Navy after his, his initial service and went off to become a professor. And they, they were close throughout their lives. Um, and, and it was very much, that relationship was very much that kind of idea, that Alger provided him another set of eyes that wasn't in the midst of the fight inside the lifelines. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, please thank you, everybody. Take five minutes, grab another drink.